Wow. B G Q plus. You know, the more I've thought about it as I've gotten older and I think about the term midlife crisis, like what does that really mean? Because I don't, I don't think that's a, an accurate representation of what guys go through as they get into to middle age. And so when you get some guy who's like middle aged and, you know, maybe he goes out and gets a cool car or maybe he is divorced and he ends up with some younger girl, uh, what do people say? Oh, he's going through his midlife crisis. Uh, but that's really not true. So, you know, I know I've mentioned before uh, Jonathan's dad, either uh, on a previous episode of Flashback or maybe it was in a magazine read-through. I, I don't really remember. But um, as I've said before, Jonathan's dad was someone I was kind of scared of. A and not because he did anything that would make anybody, like, scared. You know, it's not like... It's not like he hit his kids or he would yell or get drunk or do any of that stuff. It was just that the guy was like, he showed no emotion and like he never talked. And like, I, I never saw him angry, but I also never saw him smile. And uh, he just kind of wasn't really around that much. Like every once in a while, I would get to go do something with Jonathan and his dad. And I was always kind of nervous about it because I had to be around his dad. And uh, his dad spent most of his time when he wasn't at work out in his garage. Like they had like a pretty standard, like middle class house. It was like, you know, a three bedroom house with probably a two car garage. But uh, they parked their cars out on the driveway. Like they each had a car, you know, Jonathan's mom and Jonathan's dad. They didn't park a car in the garage because that was Jonathan's dad's shop. And what he had out there was like a hot rod. I, mean, I don't remember what it was. You know, I think, it, you know, maybe, you know, people like they'll get like a Ford Model A or a Model. I mean, you don't really ever see people do it with Model Ts, I guess. But, uh, you know, they, they turn them into hot rods. You know, they put like a fat engine in there and maybe lower it a little bit, you know, and give it kind of a racier paint job, put a nice stereo system in it. So that's what he was into. Like Jonathan's dad was like a real gearhead. Like I think he watched NASCAR, if I remember correctly. And, um, he was just really into cars and he would spend all of his time out in his garage. Uh, like the guy, I don't really understand what he did for a living exactly, but it was something car related. But, you know, he was one of these guys that, you know, he would rebuild his own cars, like start to finish. Like he could do the engine work. He could repaint it. He'd do the, like he could do everything top to bottom. And so he was always out in his garage uh, doing that kind of stuff, working on the car, smoking cigarettes, drinking beer. And, uh, and listening to what we consider oldies because uh, he had an eight track tape player uh, hooked up to a stereo system out in the garage. And, you know, he'd be out there listening to like, you know, what we would consider now to be classic rock. And, uh, you know, he would take the hot rod out and go to like car shows or we used to have, we had this drive-in. I don't mean a drive-in movie theater. I mean like a drive-in, like, like now we have the Sonic drive-ins, you know, where you, you pull up and in your car and somebody comes out and takes your order. You know, back in the 50s, of course, the, the drive-in was like a big deal, you know, where the waitresses would come out on roller skates and take your order. And, you know, it's part of that, you know, uh, stereotypical, you know, 50s Americana is the drive-in. And so they would have like once a month a meet up there, like for all the hot rod guys. And so he would take his hot rod out there and uh, I'd get to go with him sometimes. And um, <clears throat> I was thinking more about him recently because uh, uh, I just got a new car. And um, it's, it's the kind of car that I always wanted. Like, I'm not going to say what it is because it really doesn't matter. But, and, it's not, and it's not like I got a Ferrari or some kind of crazy exotic car. It's just, you know, everybody probably has the kind of car that to them is like the ideal car. Like for some people, you know, maybe that's like a a Corvette or a Mustang, or for other people, maybe that they just want a big pickup truck or a Jeep. And, you know, this is just the car that I always wanted. And so like when I was in my late teens and early twenties, you know, it's the kind of car that I was kind of obsessing over and like, oh, I would love to get a car like that. And like one of the first things that I did was start like buying up CDs and making like, like mixtape CDs. And I noticed that all the music that I was wanting to buy and to, you know, make mixtapes mix of and whatnot, was like rock music from like my late teens and, and early 20s. 
And um, when I got the car, one of my neighbors asked my wife, oh, is, is that Chris's midlife crisis car? And I, he's a cool neighbor and I like him and everything. But when, when she told me that he said that, I got kind of annoyed um, just because... No, it's not my midlife crisis car. I don't. I'm not having a midlife crisis. And I thought about it more, and it's like I don't. I don't really even know what that means. At the same time, it got me thinking about <clears throat> like the generation gap, and uh, and the fact that I prefer to listen to that kind of old music, because it in some ways does that mean I'm stuck in the past, or is it just that you know the pop culture type of stuff that we're exposed to when we're like teenagers and young adults somehow gets like cemented in our minds and and has like this special place where nothing else can ever really uh, take its place because you know like where I work with the exception of my boss who's much older than I am I'm like by far the oldest person so like the kind of music that I want to listen to like say you know Nirvana or the Red Hot Chili Peppers or whatever to them, literally, that's oldies. Like, I even asked one time, like, some song came on somebody's Spotify playlist, and I said, like, oh, is that, to you, is that, like, oldies? And, and she's like, yeah, yeah, this would definitely be oldies. And I'm just like, how can you say that, like, Nirvana is oldies? But then if you think about it, like, Nevermind came out in, like, what, 92, 91? And that was, you know, over 25 years ago. And so when I think back to when I was in like sixth grade and I'm hanging out at Jonathan's house and his dad is out in the garage listening to eight tracks, that music was at least 20 years old and to us that was oldies. But it, it just got me thinking more about, like I said, the, the generation gap and how each generation looks at the one after it. Uh, because like for, for baby boomers, like you know my generation's parents, you know, they were the first generation that really started listening to like rock and roll and folk music. And of course, their parents listened to like big band and stuff like that. And like they thought, you know, rock and roll is the devil, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, everybody looks back at that now and thinks, well, that's just ridiculous. Um, but then, you know, my generation came along and we were listening to like, you know, when I was a kid, it was like 80s new wave. But really, like when I was a teenager, it was like in uh, alternative and grunge. And of course, on TV, we were watching things like Beavis and Butthead. And, you know, my mom was horrified at all of that stuff. You know, she thought like rap music was horrible, the kind of rock music, anything with a distorted guitar was horrible. Beavis and Butthead was like the worst show in the history of television. And, you know, this is the woman who had been hearing the exact same things from her own parents about the stuff that she was into when she was young. And then she was turning around and doing it to me. And that's very common. I think that most people dealt with that. And, you know, now that I'm, you know, well, maybe middle-aged, I don't know. But, uh, you know, now I'm 40. And so now, like, the, the kids at work are, like, 20. You know, I hear this stuff they're listening to. And I'll admit it. I don't like it. Like, if, I mean, they don't listen to Justin Bieber. But, um, I mean, just to show you how out of touch I am, I really couldn't even tell you what they're listening to. Um, but... You know, I set up like this speaker system and I don't really use it just because they don't really want to listen to the stuff I want to listen to very much, especially like if I'm listening to craft work or something, they think that stuff's like really weird. But um, I mostly just use headphones and I just let them play their music. Like they all have Spotify playlists and stuff now. Uh, you know, that generation, I don't think they're not really into CDs unless they're like hipsters and they want to go collect vinyl or something. But uh, my point is just that they're so used to having older people like me, you know, give them crap about what they're listening to that when they're listening to their music, they're like practically apologizing to me. Like, oh, is it, is it okay? You probably hate this stuff. And, and sometimes I do, but I always catch myself and I don't tell them that, you know, it's like, no, no, it's fine. You know, we play whatever you like. Like, I don't, I don't mind at all just because I'm trying to be cognizant of the fact that I don't want to sound like my parents and, and treat you know, I don't have kids, obviously, but I don't want to treat, you know, the generation that my kids would have been a part of. I don't want to treat them that way because, you know, they're going to get old, you know, and by old, I mean my age. And they're going to think that like Katy Perry or Justin Bieber or, or whatever the heck they're listening to, they're going to think that's like really, really good music. And then whatever the next generation is listening to, like they're going to think that that's all crap. So... 
I just think it's kind of funny that that everybody seems to do that. And nobody ever seems to be aware uh, of what they're doing. And uh, I know that was a lot of kind of uh, uh, disjointed stuff that I was saying. Those were some disjointed thoughts. I didn't know how to kind of roll that all together. But it's just kind of the things that have been at the forefront of my mind. Like the fact that, you know, getting that car for some reason has gotten me more into listening to the stuff I was listening to when I was young. Not not really because I'm trying to relive that time. Because if you gave me the option and said, hey, do you want to travel back in time and you could be 20 again? No way. But, um, you know, if I'd say if I have any regrets, it's that I, I wish I had appreciated that time more than I did. Um, you know, I think late teens, early 20s for a lot of people is like a time of uncertainty. And maybe you're anxious or you're worried or you're, you're not able to just enjoy yourself because, like, everything seems like it's so up in the air. And, you know, maybe that excitement and all that constant change is, is part of what makes that time uh, so special. Like, I think that's why, you know, time seems to go slower when you're a kid and when you're even a young adult, uh, cause you're just taking on so much more information and your life is in like a more constant state of flux. And when you're an adult, it's like, what, what about my life right now is that much different than this time a year ago? You know, not, not much, but, uh, anyway, that was just all kind of stuff I was thinking about. And it kind of reminded me of Jonathan's dad because, you know, his generation, like those were the people that like, you know, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, like I like Bob Seger just fine. His music is cool, but his music is aimed squarely at like baby boomers who were now in like their 40s who were feeling nostalgic for, you know, the 50s and 60s. You know, I'd also say, though, that like in much the same way that a band like Bob Seger was trying to sort of tap in to that baby boomer nostalgia generation X, you know, my generation, like now we're all getting to that age where we're feeling extra nostalgic and like everybody wants to go like, you know, revisit their youths. And, uh, you know, which I think is different. It's not about, you know, reliving your youth. It's just maybe revisiting it a little bit. You know, why all of a sudden did Nintendo come out with the NES mini and now the SNES mini? It's because there's a market for that now. Like somebody like me has always been into collecting games, but you know, those systems are really aimed, you know, I mean, obviously they get purchased a lot by collectors, but they're really aimed more, I think, towards like the non-gamer who grew up with that stuff. And it's like, hey, here, you want to revisit your youth? And, you know, it's the same thing with stuff like old toys. Those are all like highly collectible now because, you know, I really think that my generation was the first that grew up in like an age of rampant materialism, you know, like the 80s. Like, what do we know the 80s for? You know, aside from, you know, like the crazy hair and bright colors and the cocaine is just like rampant materialism. And so just like all the toys that we had and the cartoon uh, tie-ins with the toys and all the video games, like people my age want to get back into all that kind of stuff. And so in a way, like that sort of thing is, is like my generation's version of Bob Seger, which I know sounds uh, pretty weird. My point is, is it's just like, I kind of think there's no such thing as a midlife crisis. I think it's just sometimes it takes you until later in life to have the things that you wanted 20 years ago. Anyway, uh, that's enough uh, for that. So uh, I I don't actually remember what game we talked. It's been so long since we did a proper episode of Flashback that I really don't even remember what game we talked about last time. And, you know, I was trying to do this all chronologically. Let's talk about these games in this chronological order. But uh, I just want to try to do the best job I can to talk about the games from back then that made an impression on me. And I don't want to try and lie and make up some fake story about how, oh, I remember the first time I played this or I definitely played this before that. But, uh, you know, we're kind of knee deep right now in the NFL playoffs. And, uh, you know, this time of year, I always get a hankering for playing Tech Mobile. To this day, I would say that Tecmo Bowl is probably one of my top five NES games. And you might be asking, well, why not Tecmo Super Bowl? Now, Tecmo Super Bowl, I will freely admit, is the better of the two games. But Tecmo Super Bowl 
didn't come out until the end of 1991. And by that time, I really wasn't playing my Nintendo anymore. I was a freshman in high school, and I was just playing other stuff, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so I never played Tecmo, uh, Tecmo Super Bowl back in the day. It wasn't until later, I think, that I even knew it existed. And uh, I think probably in the 90s when I got back into game collecting is when I found out about Tecmo Super Bowl. But, uh, but I did play the original Tecmo Bowl. I think it's probably... Uh, you know, Tecmo Bowl and Tecmo Super Bowl are probably the two best football games on the system. Uh, as I said, Super Bowl is better than Tecmo Bowl. Uh, another game that I think doesn't get the credit it deserves is NES Play Action Football. The game's not great, but you can see what they were trying to do with that game. The game runs a little bit too slow, but it's more of a sim-style game. It's got a decent little playbook. They were really trying to go for realism, you know, and when you compare that to like 10 Yard Fight, which was the first football game released uh, for the Nintendo, that was originally an Irem game, and um, but was published, I think it was probably reprogrammed by Nintendo and published by them. 10 Yard Fight is just a horrible game. And I never played that one back then. I think the first football video game I'd ever played was John Elway's Quarterback, which of course we already talked about. Uh, so Tecmo Bowl was only the second game I ever played, football game, but I uh, definitely it was an awesome game. Like that and Tecmo Super Bowl, I think really were the marquee football games uh, until John Madden Football came out on the Genesis. So like Tecmo Bowl came out early 89 and probably for the next year and a half, that was the football game everybody wanted to play. And then, of course, the first John Madden football came out in the fall of 1990 on the Genesis. I should say the first console John Madden football because, of course, it had come out on home computer before that. But, um, you know, when John Madden football came out, it instantly became, you know, the best football game uh, ever made. And then, you know, as I said, Tecmo Super Bowl didn't come out for another year. So certainly if you had been an early adopter and you had a Genesis when it came out, and you were into sports games, you were going to have John Madden football, and then when Tecmo Super Bowl came out, you weren't really going to care. So, uh, you know, I've gotten a few people who have said that they wished I would, you know, maybe kind of do the Let's Play type of thing that I did for a couple of the earlier episodes of Flashback. So instead of trying to, like, go into the nitty-gritty of Tecmo Bowl, I just figured, like, let's just play one, we'll just play one complete game uh, of Tecmo Bowl. Uh, just because any excuse to play the game is, is cool for me. So uh, let's go ahead and do that now. Now, I don't remember for sure the first time I ever played this game. I mentioned that uh, Jonathan's older brother... Let me make it brighter. Uh, Jonathan's older brother was a big-time sports gamer. I don't really ever remember seeing him play anything else. He just played, like, uh, double dribble and bases loaded uh, hoops. Wasn't it called hoops? The one-on-one -on -one basketball game. And I don't remember for sure if they had Tecmo Bowl, but I remember renting this game. And when I rented the game, it was not the first time I had ever seen it or played it. And so if not at Jonathan's house, then I don't really know where. So uh, let's just get a game started real quick, and then we'll keep talking. So I am always San Francisco, because that's my team. Now, I know you can pick Los Angeles, and then you can have Bo Jackson, and that makes the game easier, but... Uh, I don't, it doesn't feel right to me if I'm not San Francisco. So I, the only time I ever didn't pick them, you know, a while back on, on the other channel, uh, I did like a whole video dedicated to uh, Tech Mobile, and uh, then I played as different teams. But uh, normally I wouldn't do that. So we pick San Francisco, and then for the first game, it's just going to randomly pick another team. Now we got New York. Now I'm going to warn you right now that uh, New York has a very stout defense. And uh, as much as I love this game, I'm not going to try to pretend like uh, I'm some kind of wizard at it. So uh, this might not be a super high scoring affair. So, all right, tackle at the 26th. So now we're on the play selection screen here. Uh, the 49ers, just because they're kind of known at that time for like Joe Montana, Jerry Rice. You can see you've got three passing plays and one running play. Uh, many other teams had two of each, including New York. So I was going to say about renting games. So uh, when I moved in with my mom, uh, let's do a running play. When I moved in with my mom, that was really the first time I had ever 
uh, rented games. Like I have no memory of renting games when uh, I was living with my dad, uh, just because I guess there was no nowhere up there to rent games. I remember us going and renting movies. Uh, in fact, uh, we used to rent movies at Tower Records. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if all Tower Records rented movies or or not. Because I know the one where I live, we, it didn't have rentals. But this one, where I live with my dad, you could you could rent movies, but they didn't rent video games. So when I moved in with my mom, we lived close by to a uh, like mom and pop rental store. Like we didn't have any of the national chains, like uh, Blockbuster or whatever. But, uh, you know, I used to go in there and rent games. And, you know, usually it'd be like a Friday night. You know, my mom and I would go in there together and, you know, maybe she would get a movie and um, I would get to rent a game. You know, I had to ask, oh, can I get a game? You know, and sometimes, you know, because that was probably another three or four bucks. And so it just depended on whether or not she had the money, you know. So, um, you know, hopefully I'd get to pick a game. And uh, there we go. And, you know... It, Friday night was probably like the peak time to to rent video games, and so if you didn't get to the store early enough, all the good stuff was gone. Like all the AAA titles would would be gone, and so if you were going in there looking for like uh, Super Mario Brothers 2 or Contra or, or something like that, you know Castlevania, if you didn't get there early enough, it, it wasn't going to be there, and you were going to end up getting sort of a B-list title, which didn't mean that it was bad. Like I remember renting. Uh, a boy in his blob one time because that was a game that I was never gonna buy but uh, I got to rent it and it was pretty cool so uh, so like I said I remember renting this game and uh, I'm not gonna say it was like the first game I ever rented or anything but um, but I had a lot of fun with it for sure it wasn't the first football game I'd ever played because as we've already talked about you know I, I played uh, John Elway's quarterback uh, this is certainly a better game uh, it's it's very arcadey and in fact, uh, just in case not everybody knows this, uh, Tecmo Bowl was an arcade game before it came out on the Nintendo. And in fact, it was a pretty cool arcade cabinet. It had two screens, but the screens were both um, like in the vertical position. They were both rotated and then put together. So you got kind of this interesting widescreen display. If you ever play, uh, you know, just load it up in MAME or something and check out Tecmo Bowl, or even just watch a video of it on YouTube. You know, you can see the similarities, but it, it's also, you know, quite a bit different. Uh, it didn't have, you know, Tecmo Bowl here, we didn't have an NFL license, but it has the NFL PA license. So it has NFL cities, but not the actual teams, but it has all the player names, which is pretty cool. And uh, in the arcade, it didn't have that. But, uh, I mean, the arcade game, I don't know, it, it just had a little bit of a different feel to it. It was, you know, the same... The same view and everything, it, it just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, I guess. You know, just just check it out and play it. I actually think that this Nintendo version is better, which is actually, you know, oddly kind of the case with a lot of those early Nintendo games, like Contra was an arcade game originally, and I think the Nintendo version is definitely better. Where's this guy going? Oh, crap. Ooh, got it. Um, interception. Um... What was I saying? So yeah, I think this is just better than the arcade version, which is pretty cool. Uh, so just, in ca I don't know, I can't imagine anybody doesn't really know how this game works, but you know, you've got the four plays to choose from on offense, and then when you're on defense, you just have the other team's four plays. And basically, if you can correctly guess uh, which play they're gonna run, you can like sack the quarterback and get a quick stop. And if you didn't correctly guess, then you're just going to have to play the best defense you can. So, um, you know, I'm trying to mix it up a little bit. Uh, so far, I've gotten lucky, and the Giants haven't um, haven't guessed any of my offensive plays. I'm doing a lot better, actually. I, I played a game earlier today just to kind of warm up, and I got the Giants then, too. And I was having a much harder time. Like, they were, like, seemingly correctly guessing uh, what play I was going to run a lot of the time. And so it was a much lower scoring game, but like I've already got 14 points. So uh, so that's pretty good. One thing I wanted to point out that I think is cool about Tech Mobile, and it's the kind of thing that maybe you don't think about, is when you're kicking off the ball, you see you have like this power meter. And, uh, you know, it maxes out and then goes back to zero. And you might be thinking, okay, so what? But, you know, if you think about playing golf games from back in the day where you had like that three-click system, the meter would fill up and then it would turn around and go back down. 
and it made it a lot more forgiving. But maybe because this game came out of the arcade, once it gets full, it resets back to zero. Now, obviously I'm kicking the ball off here, so I want to kick the ball as far as I can. And so you're like riding this fine line of you want to get that meter just as full as possible, but if you push the button like a split second too late, you pay a pretty heavy price because you're going to kick the ball like 10 yards or something. And, you know, maybe the kind of thing that people don't really think about, but imagine how much different the game would be if the, the power meter bounced back and forth instead of starting again at zero. All right, so that's the end of the first quarter. I can see I said it's kind of cool. They have the little advertisements for their games uh, uh, there. You know, when I when I played this game or when I first heard of this game and started playing it, you know, Tecmo Bowl, I got to say that the word Tecmo probably really didn't mean anything to me. You know, the only other game I had probably played or seen by them was Ninja Gaiden, although I couldn't tell you off the top of my head when that game came out. I know uh, that Jonathan had Ninja Gaiden and he played it quite a bit but I don't know when that game came out. And so I think the word Tecmo, I didn't really know what that meant. But you know when you're a kid, I think you don't really pay that much attention. So another interception, so that's good. I'm having a much better time this time than, uh, than last time. So, you know, with these early, when you, when you start the game, you know, the way, the way Tecmo Bowl works is you basically have to play every other team. Like you play the first, I think it's the first seven teams, and then all of a sudden you're in the playoffs. And then that, I think there's three rounds in the playoffs. I might be off by one game. And the last game is like the Tech Mobile, like the championship game. But uh, you don't ever play the same team twice. It's just you play every other team. And what happens is that this game gets harder with each subsequent game. So like because this is the first game of the season or what have you, uh, this game is going to be easy, right? Like there's no, you don't ever lose the first game in Tech Mobile uh, if you've played the game for any length of time. So, really, it just becomes an exercise of, like, how much can I run up the score and uh, how little can I let the other team score? And I used to always try to get the score up to 100. Like, if you're really on top of things, you can score, like, four touchdowns per quarter and, you know, get the score up over 100. But uh, that's not that easy to do. Uh, so there you see that, that the Giants correctly guessed I was going to run the ball, and that's why they stopped me behind the line of scrimmage. So... Um, that's just, I guess, uh, you know, luck of the draw or whatever. Um, oh, but am I going to make it? Yep. Made it. So, uh, you know, usually what I do on defense is I generally call one of their two passing plays because then you'll just sack the quarterback because I think it's a lot easier to sort of manually defend against a run than it is a pass. So if you get lucky, you'll sack the quarterback. Um, if you call the right passing play, if you call the wrong passing play, you've got an opportunity to uh, intercept the ball. And if they run it, then you can just try to stop the guy. So, um, you know, I try to get a lot of three and outs that way. But, uh, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll connect for a long pass or a guy will get sprung for a long run. Uh, you know, especially if you get tied up with a guy and, and one of his defenders gets there before your guys get there, then it'll, you'll get knocked off. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, there's different ways of playing the game. I know there's, like, a lot of guys who, like, you know, you watch on YouTube videos, guys have these techniques of running all over the field and doing crazy stuff. And uh, I've never really gotten into doing that. I just, I guess I have my own, my own play style. So you can see, you know, I keep calling a, a pass defense because I think that, you know, usually when they run the ball, you can stop them after a few yards. And so here you can see that I, I force them to punt the ball. That was a pretty darn good punt, though. So hopefully I can get some of these yards back. But, you know, this is a game where, you know, I really like 8-bit sports games because they're they're just simple. Like, this is very simple. I mean, it doesn't even completely follow the rules of football, but uh, it's just a lot of fun to play. And, you know, especially this time of year, uh, you know, when, you know, football playoffs are going on, like I said, it just gets me in the mood to play Tech Mobile. And, you know, in some ways, this game is like the video game version of, like, comfort food. There we go. Uh, that, and like I said, playing, you know, maybe like one of the first few Madden games on the Genesis. Um, 
The first Madden game was good on the Genesis, but it was a little rough around the edges. But like Madden 92, Madden 93, or, or Madden 94, uh, those were all really good games. I think later, I, I don't I don't like the games as much because they tried to maybe do too much with too little as far as the graphics go on the Genesis. But, um, you know, Tecmo Bowl or Tecmo Super Bowl, you know, you can always come back to these games, I think. And uh, they're just a whole lot of fun to play. Now, there is a website, I, I think it's called techmobowl.org, I'm not, I'm not positive, but you could Google it, where they still uh, do roster updates every year for Tecmo Super Bowl, and I, wow, barely didn't make it. And uh, I talked about that in the Tecmo Bowl retrospective video that I did. You know, if you have like a, either if you have a flash cart, or if you just want to play with an emulator, you can download the ROM for like the, you know, the newest version of the game, so like you could get a, you know, 2017, 2018 uh, roster update for uh, Tecmo Super Bowl. And what's cool is that they've even put in the new teams. Uh, like teams that don't exist anymore get taken out and they've put in new teams complete with their artwork and everything. And uh, it's pretty awesome, especially if you have like an EverDrive or something, because then you can still play it on your Nintendo. But uh, uh, even if you don't, you can just load it up in an emulator or whatever and uh, it's no big deal. So this is the end of the half. Uh, so, you know, normally I skip the halftime show, but we can watch it. Uh, it was kind of a cool little touch, I guess, just to add a little bit of, you know, realism or immersion or whatever into the game to have the cool little halftime show here with the cheerleaders and everything. And that's it. Okay. So now I kick the ball off to start the third quarter. Like I said, we're up 28 to nothing, so, you know, it's a given that we're going to win the game. Uh, I'm just kind of hoping that maybe we'll get to see some some cool stuff. Like when I played the game this morning, you know, the other team had like a missed field goal or they actually blocked one of my extra points, which was neat. Uh, that would be kind of cool to show. So far, I don't think we've really seen anything particularly noteworthy. Just barely missed picking that ball off. So you can see that they got sort of they got sprung for a for a big uh, gain there because, you know, I guessed one pass play, but they ran the other one. And I just couldn't quite get Ronnie Lott over there fast enough. But uh, see, like I said there, you know, I didn't call the correct running play, but it's just a lot easier to defend against running play. So, like, I wouldn't waste a call on defense um, trying to defend a running play when, you know, they're probably not going to run it. So, you know, unfortunately there, they, they called the, the pass play that the one wasn't the one I called. And they had two open receivers, and so I could only cover one of them. And in retrospect, I probably should have gone and covered the deeper receiver. Uh, plus, that was actually my assigned coverage uh, on the play. So, like here, this guy is my assigned coverage. So there, you know, you just stand right in front of him, and you just easily pick the ball off. Which is nice. So, uh, because they were in field goal range there, so um, that keeps them off the board. You know, again, I mean, no danger of losing the game, but, um, you know, it, it just becomes like, well, how much of a point differential can I build up, or can I stop them from scoring at all just for fun? Because, you know, as you get into the later rounds of the game, uh, it does get harder. It doesn't mean the game becomes impossible, but, you know, when you're a seasoned player, it, it just seems like a cakewalk uh, to play the game. Uh, the earlier the earlier games in Tech Mobile. All right, I'm gonna go for a deep shot, pass three, where uh, uh, both of the outside receivers just run basically go routes. Uh, hopefully they don't, uh, well, see, they guess the play correctly, so you're not gonna get the pass off. And you can always tell because what'll happen is the play starts, all the receivers are covered, and all your offensive linemen like just get thrown up in the air. And at that point, the worst thing you can do is start running backwards because, like, no matter what, you're toast. So just take the sack with, like, a minimal uh, loss of yards. Like, you can see I lost six yards in the play, which is really no big deal. I'm just going to call the same play over again and just see if we can just, you know, pick up a huge chunk of yards here. Uh, so that guy's covered, so we're going to go down there. And you see he was wide open, and so I just picked up quite a few yards. Uh, there's no, oh man, I, I thought I was toast a little bit earlier. So that's pretty good. I didn't, I didn't see what yard line we were on. Was it around the 30 or something? So we just picked up about, you know, 40, 50 yards on that play. So that's nice. It's funny. I don't, you know, I don't think this game really has like AI. 
because you got to feel like, well, you can't just always run it. Uh, wow, it's barely, barely didn't make it in there. You know, if I always run it or I always pass it, you're thinking, well, the AI is going to learn, you know, not to bother defending against the run if you never run or whatever. But I don't really think this game is even sophisticated enough. I really think it's just based on like random number generators or whatever. That's right, so there's another touchdown. Once again by Catfish, Roger Craig. Uh, that's going to put us up 35 to nothing. Kind of hoping they'd, they'd block an extra pointer. Oh, here they might block this one. There you go. They got it. So when that happens, there's, I don't really know that there's anything you can do about it because that defender came through the line before the meter even started charging up. So unless there's some secret there that I don't know about, you're you're pretty much just going to get the extra point blocked. And so now it's 34 nothing uh, instead of 35 to nothing. So I, I think I've just been calling pass one every time, just defending against pass one, because you know you can see, you know they're just running this running play. I guess they're running run two there, and you know it's easy enough just to try to stay away from that lead blocker who's going to try to tie you up, and uh, just try to get behind the line and uh, tackle him. You see that time the guy got through, and uh, there's nothing you can really do about it, I guess, except just uh, be better. Which is too bad, because if I had uh, stopped him there, that would have forced a punt. So when you get tied up like that, what you want to do is you just got to keep hammering the buttons. And uh, if you hammer him fast enough, you'll you'll drop the guy. But uh, if he has any help come over, then that guy's going to gonna throw you off his guy. And then they can keep going. So, yep. See, even that, like, that was a very quick stop, but even then they gained three yards on the play. And uh, at least, as far as I can tell, you can't really do much better than that. Tried to go for the sack there, even though I didn't think I was going to make it, and it didn't really work out. But I mean, at this point, I'm up 34 to nothing. If they score, it really doesn't matter. It's more about just trying to have some fun. So um, yeah, see, I missed the tackle there too. But uh, so now they're down to the 12. So really at this point, if I can't get an interception, they're going to get on the board somehow. So see, I called the same passing play they did there. And so I got a sack. But uh, they only lost a handful of yards there. Missed the tackle again. And this guy's gone. So it's hard because when you, when you go to tackle, you're kind of diving. And you can only dive at like specific angles, like I think 90 and 45 degree angles. And so if the other player is, uh, you know, between those angles, uh, he's going to get by. And, and really what I should have done is just try to tie the guy up uh, until somebody else could get over there and help me. But if his little blocker guy gets over there first, then um, I'm just going to get thrown off. So. so Giants got on the board there. Now it's 34 to 7. It doesn't really matter. There's no way with, uh, you know, a minute left in the game. And, you know, in this game, the game clock uh, seems to maybe run a little bit fast. Uh, well, maybe not. That seems like it's about right. But, you know, there's only like a minute and a half per quarter. And unfortunately, there's no way to change that. This game would be pretty fun if, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to probably have like full 15-minute quarters or anything. But uh, but it'd be kind of fun if, if the game was at least a little bit longer. But, you know, again, this game had like arcade roots, right? So, you know, there, the the way the arcade game worked is you'd put in quarters and you were buying time. Like, you'd put in a quarter, and I think that would give you something like two minutes uh, to play the game. So, uh, you know, you didn't want to have, like, really long games because you didn't want, want to tie up the machine, so. I've actually never seen in person uh, a Tecmo Bowl uh, arcade cabinet. I've only seen uh, pictures of it on the internet, and then I've, you know, I've played the game in MAME, there you, oh, see, look, I barely got that one off. Uh, I've played the game in MAME and watched videos of it on YouTube, but uh, I don't know how rare the arcade cabinet is, but I've never run across one. Uh, interestingly, I, I know I've pointed this out on uh, epi uh, an episode of Let's Read. I don't remember which one, but I remember we were reading a magazine that had an advertisement for Tecmo Bowl from before the game had come out, I think. I think it was before it had come out. And it was cool because the artwork used in the game used the arcade artwork, like the marquee, instead of the artwork from um, from the game cartridge. Because they don't, they don't really look that similar. Like in the arcade, 
it had this like red, white, and blue motif to it. And you know, here you have like Tech Mobile and that green uh, like block print. So only about 30 seconds left in the game now. Uh, cool, we got to see you know a, a blocked extra point and whatnot. Other than that, it's just about you know kind of giving some flavor of the game and and what it's like. You know, I have no idea how much a copy of this game costs. I'm sure it's quite a bit cheaper than Tecmo Super Bowl. People, I mean, obviously, if you've never played either game and you just want to get like a good football game for the Nintendo, you know, why wouldn't you get Tecmo Super Bowl? And um, so I, and plus it, it's just a better game. And so that game is certainly going to be worth a little bit more than this one. I also wouldn't be surprised to learn that this game uh, had a higher print run just because Tecmo Super Bowl came out in uh, in late 91. So that was getting towards the end of the Nintendo sort of usable lifespan. But I mean, there are plenty of copies of both games. Like neither game is even remotely rare. But you know, the other thing is if you get a copy of, uh, I got score on again. If you get a copy of Tecmo Super Bowl, there are actually places that you can send it where they will burn a ROM of like the current uh, uh, roster update from techmobile.org, they can burn that onto a, a little EEPROM chip and stick that into the cartridge so that you can actually have sort of a semi-legit uh, version of the game, uh, which is kind of cool. I mean, that's I'm sure that costs like 30 or 40 bucks and the, the game is still gonna end up being like obsolete uh, the next season, but I mean, that's no different than buying you know, any sports, any modern sports game. So uh, there you go, that's the end of the game. Uh, they give you the little box score there and you see across the bottom it has your password uh, because you can write that down and then you can come back to it later. So you don't have to try to play an entire season in one sitting. So I'm not gonna play the next game, but just to show you how it works. So now if I hit the button, you go back here and it's gonna just randomly select the, the next team. Now it says second week and it will do that after every subsequent game until you have uh, played and beaten every other team. And uh, you can't lose in this game. I don't, if I remember correctly, if you lose, you get game over. So uh, you always want to write your password down because if you lose, then you know you can go back and, and uh, try again. So now we're playing Miami. It's a pretty good quarterback duel because now you got Joe Montana versus Dan Marino. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's just one of the really cool things I think about this game is that it had all the real players in it, which in my opinion, is more important than having the teams. Like if you had the 49ers, but none of the real players, I don't see how that's really that cool. I mean, I'm San Francisco, the dudes are like red and gold, and you know, you have all the real players, and uh, and how cool is that? So uh, I'm gonna stop right there and not play anymore. Um, and I guess that's gonna wrap up this episode of Flashback. Uh, I just, I love playing this game, I can't get enough of it. I'm thinking, and you know, I'm not saying anything for sure, but uh, I'm thinking that probably the next episode of Flashback, we're not gonna play a game uh, because I really wanna talk about Legos. I've had a lot of people ask about uh, the Legos I have behind me on the shelf, and I have more than that. Because this, this same time period, you know, like late 88, early 89, is also when I got really into Legos, and that's again because of Jonathan. He got, he got me into Legos. And uh, I still have every Lego set that I ever bought or ever had given to me as a kid. And so it'd be really cool, I think, to go through and uh, check out some of those early 90s, late 80s, early 90s Lego sets. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of CGQ Flashback. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.